Hi, my name is Greg Madison, and this is the third episode of The Living Process. This time, it's my pleasure to be talking with Lynn Preston. Lynn's a good friend of mine. We met at a focusing conference in Germany many years ago and have kept in touch, taught together, uh, had a lot of conversations. We have a lot of play fights about particular things, as you'll see in this episode. Lynn is very well known in the focusing world. She's been a part of focusing oriented therapy from before there was such a thing, really. She is also a relational psychoanalyst and uh, teaches at the Institute of Contemporary Psychoanalysis. She recently has also developed a Help for Helpers group and a community empowerment group. So uh, in addition to all of her work in psychotherapy and the focusing world, she's also expanding into more community development, which we touch on also in this episode. We talk a little bit about how Lynn got into um, the world of focusing and how she first met Jean Gendlin. We talk a bit about the kinds of conversations that they used to have, and especially discussions about theory that they would have and that Lynn and I also have. We spoke a bit about self-disclosure and working relationally in psychotherapy. And we also touched upon some of the issues in psychoanalysis and how to work in an informed way without imposing theory upon the client. So this is my conversation with Lynn. I think you can tell that we uh, enjoy each other's company. Lynn Preston. The Living Process. Hello, welcome back. And I am very happy to say that I'm with my friend, Lynn Preston. Hello, Lynn. Hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about your doing the first blog, I think, of uh, having to do with focusing. I think that's just incredible. Great, thank you. So we don't have that much time, and I say that only because I know when we start talking, the time goes quite quickly. Oh, yes. And that maybe this isn't going to be the only time we talk. Hopefully, oh. there'll, be, yeah, there'll be other conversations. But maybe before we get into anything too meaty, um, would you say just a bit about your history of focusing and how you met Jean maybe and kind of where it took you professionally in terms of therapy? Yeah, I'll try to say that all very briefly because people can find it in our other dialogues. Okay. Um, but uh, as a as a young woman, um, I was studying all different kinds of therapeutic approaches, and I came across Gene very much by accident. Somebody showed me a flyer of him, and um, I w went to 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 see what he had to say, and I was mesmerized not by what he said, but how he said it and how he was with people and how the way he was with people brought out all of this depth. And um, it's as if each person that he, that he spoke to came alive and their voices were heard in a different kind of way. And, and I was amazed at that and knew immediately that I wanted to study with him and uh and I was in in therapy with him uh for a year and uh and got together a study group in which this is this is a little detail that I think is important that when I asked him to do this study group uh the fee for it was that each person had to take on a client free uh, in exchange for the the training that he was giving us, and uh, and then 
use that client as a way of of uh, uh, studying how to be with that person in a in a focusing kind of way. And I think that's a detail that that hasn't been widely known. That sounds so much like Jean. It's a very creative way to kind of spread focusing to people that may not have access to it otherwise. Mm. So yeah. so I I uh, studied with Jean. I was in therapy with Jean. Uh, he described focusing as a as a you know process or a technique. I didn't take to it. It wasn't until years later that I got what the depth and the but but in his um uh, in his desire not to um contaminate the therapy with his wanting me to uh learn from his way he didn't um he didn't pursue it at all and I had to come to it later through workshops and things like that so that's also a, a detail that's sort of interesting that I don't think I've said before. That in, uh, in the therapy with you, he dropped it so completely that you had to go and find it someplace else. Well, he didn't drop the living of it, the phenomenology yeah. of it, the way he was being with me. Yes, but he dropped any talk about it. Mm -hmm. and uh, and I learned so much about dropping the talk about things yeah. um, from from that experience with him. Um, so then when he left New York, uh, I've always been very interested in what psychoanalysts call working in the relationship, you know, being the relationship um, that we're that we're working on. And uh, so I went to, into psychoanalysis and studied psychoanalysis and not the old kind, but <laughs> I, I, the, the, the uh, relational intersubjective psychoanalysis. Um, yeah. We still have the old kind here in Britain. Oh, really? Yes. Not I, just that, but we do still have that. Yes, yes. We probably do in, in New York. I'm not so in touch with it. But I could say a little story yeah. that, that might um, bring out the uh, the essence of it for me. Uh, when I went, when I met my psychoanalyst, uh, I said that I was worried about um, all of the things that we're worried about with the old psychoanalysis um, about uh, her hiding behind her role, uh, not having a, a real dialogue, not being able to talk about uh, what was going on between us, things like that. And I was telling her about um, a client that I had that I that I was having trouble making connection with and saying, uh, I, I I want us to be able to really wrestle together and saying that about the therapy. And she said, well, let's do it. I was so amazed. She got down on the floor with me and and we were wrestling. Uh, and that, uh, of course, I was a lot younger and she, <laughs> she was a lot younger. Um, but I was so taken with her Mm -hmm. willingness to do that and to mold the relational dance around what what I was was needing and it was interesting what I took away from it that I couldn't say to her and and I I'm always very interested in what we can't say in a relationship uh was that I was stronger than she and I I felt um her fragility in a certain kind of way mm -hmm. and and uh and how we were ne negotiating that um yeah i mean maybe it wasn't even true but that was <laughs> that was my that was my feeling 
and you were interacting with her in a way that protected that in her? I wasn't sure. I was questioning yeah. that in my mind. Yeah. But we hadn't built up enough of a relationship for me to bring that up. But it, it would have been wonderful if I could have said mm -hmm. that. She could have been open to that. I love the the image of the two of you wrestling. <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is uh, very liberating to imagine that. So I got back with with uh, in touch with Jean uh, mm -hmm. after that, and um, and we were he came back to New York eventually. We were dialoguing, and um, I was uh, a mentee and and a colleague, and I had wonderful experiences of of hashing things out with him and developing things with him and um yeah before we i mean i think that gives a a good indication of the depth of your um history and all of this and with gene um before we get into maybe some of the things that you used to hash out which i think would be interesting i'm just curious when i hear that history i think why psychoanalysis rather than um, sort of humanistic or person-centered? I would have thought with the acquaintance with Gene that that might have been a more obvious next step. Oh, that's such a good question. I felt that there is some magic some power in uh in the transference in the transference of being being able to build the, enough trust so that you're playing out things with the therapist and uh Carl Rogers and the humanistic um therapy people yeah. were talking much more about uh being real mm -hmm. uh, with the person, but being in the here and now, being real, not getting into what they would see as a, as a, a projection. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I was interested in in being with someone. Uh, I was familiar with Winnicott's writing, and then Kohut sort of came on the scene. Uh, and the whole idea of of just being able to be with someone that would um, would allow all the things that you that you go through in a relationship that uh, that are a combination, I would say now, of projection of of the the other person projecting on to you of fantasy of reality of mm -hmm. uh the whole uh the whole wide spectrum of relational issues um and and it was i wanted to learn how to do that and i learned how to do it in a way that incorporates a lot of gene's philosophy and puts together the uh person-centered approach, Gene's approach, uh, and and the psychoanalytic history. That's interesting to me because when I've seen you practice, um, it it's an interesting, I mean, in terms of practice, it is something that I would be familiar with, but where it's coming from is slightly different. Mm. And the thing that I notice is that you're very, very present to the real relationship that's happening between you and the other person. You're not interpreting something that seems like it's coming out of the blue. And yet somehow you're being present. It feels like you're being present to something that's more than just an alliance. There's also 
something else. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and this this being present to the something else mm -hmm. is very much in in Genlin's work and in Genlin's philosophy. This idea that uh, that we welcome everything and that we give a voice to everything and that um, as as the therapist we're on its side and mm -hmm. we're going to the this it mm -hmm. uh, this it on the implicit level and not on the factual level mm -hmm. you know so that uh uh gene and i would would be working very similarly in many situations the the thing that's different is that um, Gene, and, and I just came across where he says this, his feeling of uh, the relationship um, only needing attention when there's trouble. Yeah. yeah. And my feeling that, that the relationship is a vehicle. He says this also, that mm -hmm. the relationship is a vehicle for the, uh, for the experiencing of the client. But but he's happy when the relationship is smooth and there was another word he used uh smooth and uh soft i think he said i have to look it up mm -hmm. um i am suspicious of not suspicious i i think uh i'm happy when the relationship is smooth and soft but i'm aware that there's a lot more and and i'm very aware that it's what can be said mm -hmm. giving different experiences a voice and feeling safe to say to say them with yeah. the other person and learning how to say them so for me uh what i call talking about you and me is a very big part of the process, not only when it's in trouble, but just as a part of of being of intimacy, of being able to live the relationship, to be uh, the interaction that's going to to make something new happen, to be willing. And and I, the way that I say the transference thing is to be willing to be a representative of life, of the parent, of whatever um and and not to deny it and say oh no i didn't you know uh i don't think that mm -hmm. i remember when when one of my clients was very upset with me and said uh you know you you said that i was a borderline and i was horrified because uh relational psychoanalysts and focusing people don't like that at all it's like calling somebody a, a name, right? Yeah. I said, why well, I said that? But I wasn't going to say I never said that. I said, what did I say? That isn't that isn't a part of me that I want to identify with. What did Lynn say to you? Uh, and, and acknowledging, as one client of mine put it, that she has a, a Lynn within and not denying that I'm, <laughs> that I'm not responsible for the the Lynn within. At at the same time, if if the if she said, "Well, do do you think I'm a borderline?" I would say, "No, that isn't a way that I uh, that I find helpful." Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I I totally agree with you. Um, when Jean says the relationship really only needs attention when there's some kind of a rupture or something's gone wrong. I think that's far too limiting. And I remember when I would challenge him on that and I would say, it's like you fall back into this kind of person-centered sort of, I'm here, they're there, and I'm protecting their space. And I would say, you know, your philosophy is all about the relational, the interaction, the, you know, who do you become with this person? You're not some set identity. You're 
who you become is information about your way of being together, about the other person, about yourself. Um, and he said, but, but all of that's there. He knows it's all there. And I suspect he's feeling it all in the interaction, but he's not verbalizing it. Right. I'm wondering if that's a big difference. Yes, yes. Well, I think that for me, there's a huge contradiction in his philosophy there because one of the things that's so important about focusing is that when we make the implicit explicit, there's this release yeah. and there's this new energy and new ability to conceptualize, to embrace something, to digest something. And this is the little steps that move forward. So why would you not exactly. make the implicit of the relationship explicit? Exactly. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. No, it's another kind of symbolizing. Yes, of course. And if you're symbolizing the relationship, then of course the client is also changing, just like if they were focusing only on something sort of in their own body. Yes. So what sort of... I get a sense maybe this was one of the things that would come up with you and Jean, um, what other kinds of things did you like to hash over with him? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, uh, I know one, but <laughs> I'll oh, give yes, you what, what one are you thinking of? Well, the one I'm thinking of is the one that you and I also like to play with: is the question of theory and the role of theory and um just before we started recording i was telling you of this conversation i recorded of the three of us where you and gene were having this back and forth about theory and he was he ended up laughing at himself because he was almost saying there's no place for theory in therapy or in this kind of interaction and then he reminded himself that he was teaching this course on theory construction and thinking at the edge and all these different ways to have theory <clears throat> but it, it still makes me wonder even as you were talking um my sense is when you're with a client there's no separate theory there for you is that right well i wouldn't say it that way i would say <laughs> i i would say that all of us uh therapists and not therapists are referencing stories patterns experiences uh about the dynamic of the other person and about the dynamic of you uh, and the other person together and and those stories uh references that all of us make um are are what i call theory it's a way of making sense of things mm -hmm. and for me um and jean agrees with would agrees with this here <laughs> up there <laughs> wherever he is <laughs> agrees with me about this that uh you know, the more theories that you have, or theories that touch you, the more you can feel oriented. But I, I think that where Gene and I agree is his idea, and you and I, I agree, is that having the theories right next to you, but not between you and the client. He yeah. says, I have my bag of tricks, my techniques, my theories, I feel the same way about techniques as mm -hmm. it, you know, that techniques in therapy can be very uh, uh, limiting if they're between you and the client and, and also theories. So um, what I learned from Jean's philosophy is that uh, on the, on the explicit level, 
you have something that's true and then you could have something that's false. But on this broader implicit level, you have something that's true and something that completely contradicts it that's true and something mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. that uh, might be the enemy of that thing that's true. Absolutely. And feeling those uh, all together, I think, makes a very rich, more oriented, grounded therapy. So let me, uh, I want to say a couple of things. The sure. first is um, that when you talk about having technique in between, of course, that would include focusing. Trying to get the client to focus can be having this big thing in between that protects the right, therapist right, right. and makes yes, them feel yes, effective yes. and all that. Right, right. Um, but the thing that I wanted to challenge a little bit more is I, I will accept your definition of theory. It's different than mine. You're using theory in a much more broad sense of all of the guiding experiences, wisdom, patterns, learning, everything that's there implicitly, I would say. So I would say that when you sit across from someone in a therapeutic context, and I mean you, not just generally, mm -hmm. that the likelihood is that you really do sit there as yourself. You have the confidence to do that. And that what you find in yourself is this ebb and flow of all of these different experiencing that is now crossing with that particular client and different things are coming up. Their story, your story, things you may have learned in the past, but they're coming up because for some reason they're evoked, they're, they're implied in that particular interaction. Yeah. That they come up that way, which for me is something I totally accept. It's that in your learning and experiencing up until now, certain things have resonated and they've gone in and they've become a part of you in some way. Mm -hmm. If you want to call all of that theory, that's fine with me. Then I need to have a different word for the kind of theory that I often do see used in therapy, which is much more, um, it may not be manualized in that it may not tell you exactly what to do, but it can tell you what you think is happening. It can give you a framework that is uh, imported not evoked, but simply imported as the therapist's own structure for how to think about everything, including this particular client. That is yeah. very different from what I would say you do. Yes, yes. I love the way that you said that because we've had this uh, <laughs> this sort of play fight for so many years. Um, and, and that solves it, that uh, when... Uh, when theory is evoked is very different than when it's imported. Yes. And, and I would say that even when it's imported, um, that it needs to be tried on and felt through. And yes. Like, is this going on? Uh, yeah. If it's imported as a suggestion, then it can still do something. If it's imported in a more oppressive way, where the client isn't allowed to object. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I was thinking in that instance of just the, the therapist mm -hmm. by herself thinking, what the hell is going on around here? And then is it is it like what Winnicott says? Is it like what this one says? Is it like Jean saying that? And then trying on each of those mm -hmm. theories and then finding something that somebody says that says, oh, that gives me, oh, maybe. And then one could mm. uh, try that that out. But I, I could give you an example. There's, there, there's uh, on um, 
Can I just say something before we go to your example? Let's uh, let's hold that and go right back to it. But what I want to say is, for me, I would like there to be an in-between step where the therapist is like, what is going on here? And just totally like, whoa, whoa. And rather than going to five different theories to try to anchor him or herself, instead would go into that experience, first of all, and yeah. maybe come up with the symbolizing. It's like, my goodness, I feel like I'm stuck in the mud down by the lake and 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 it's getting dark and I, I, there should be some way out of this and i can't move and then ah it reminds me of what so and so said about blah 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 and then right. maybe there's a, a slightly more digested way of offering it right so that in between step feels important to me although it doesn't always come but if it comes i think it helps something Absolutely. I totally, totally agree okay. with you. And that, and that's the murky edge. Yes. Right? Uh, that Jean talks about um, listening and, and uh, uh, responding until there comes this sort of murky edge where you don't know what else to say or and then just staying there. Mm -hmm. So it's the staying there mm -hmm. place and maybe even saying it as, as you say, oh, I don't know what's there. Let's stay and see what's, what's happening mm -hmm. here. Um, so let's go to your example. You have a good example. Well, I, I, I did this. Uh, I was a guest speaker. I think you might've even heard this story years ago um, on a, uh, a YouTube, a uh, live YouTube channel um, where uh, guests were, um, were, I don't know if they were all therapists or, but at any rate, I was a guest on this live YouTube show and uh, a, a young woman uh, in Chicago was the 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 client that I was supposed to demonstrate with. And very shortly into the conversation, um she um she said that that she was actively suicidal. And um and here I am, you know, miles away. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I've never met her before and she doesn't have any support system. And um, and I was asking her more about that, listening and reflecting and making an, what I call making an us. We're together, mm -hmm. you know, seeing what this is, this su su what she called suicidal ideation. And uh, and she she was sort of mystified about it herself and said, I don't know why, you know on those days, I don't want to do anything and I just want to be dead. I, I don't understand it. And um, so the, the the theory that came to mind is the theory of, of dissociation when the inner conflict is too, too great or feelings are overwhelming that one has to cut off from another part. And that the most important thing is to is to be able to hear from, you know, from both of them, many of them. And so uh, I had said, um, maybe you and I could sit back together and and sort of ask her, what what is this, right? Uh, and we were able to use focusing is mostly a, a focusing um but but that theory really helped me mm -hmm. gave me support yeah to say oh i don't have to solve the problem i just have to um get this voice that silenced uh and if if anybody wants to to see that it's it's uh called um uh, what is it called? 
something about the unknown self. I was saying, oh, we don't know her. So you could find that on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on my channel. Okay, that's good to know. Um, it's, in, it's a really good example because it, <clears throat> before you t said what you did, I was following along and sort of thinking, oh my goodness, like what would I do? Mm. And I would have done something that sounds very similar. I would have said, like, can you and I just sort of see her on one of those days? Mm. See if we can get a sense of, you know, what's really happening for her. Mm. And then I would go into my body and feel Mm. can I sense a day like that, what it feels like, and given what she said so far, what, what that would really be like. So then I'm thinking to myself, I'm not using theory, but I am using theory in your sense of the word. And I am even in the other sense, because what I'm doing is I am feeling inside of myself for what is... I'm assuming something's almost being defeated there mm, on, yeah. on those days. And that's an assumption of mine that comes from not only years of focusing practice, but also listening to Jean and you and all sorts of other people talking about the power of carrying forward and sort of when something is stuck, that it still is implying what it thinks can't happen, but needs to happen. And so there is a very implicit sense of theory as well as just sensing in. Right. And and even the idea of sitting with her uh, and, and feeling about the other one, that idea mm -hmm. of, uh, and we, and I, I don't like the word parts at all, it's not parts, right? <laughs> but we don't have, good language for that but the the idea that the self isn't unitary mm -hmm. uh, is, is a theory basically that you know people didn't think about uh before well uh, is it a theory or is it a discovery that then requires theory well i i i guess in my way of thinking of theory Theory is always a discovery each time you you use it. Uh, we haven't time. quite we haven't quite overcome. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Well, uh, there's there's a psychoanalyst uh, who hates the idea that of parts of a person or not, and and says you know there's a cohesive self and that's a truth too uh and those two those two for me those mm. two truths don't have to obliterate each other but the I, discovery doesn't i would <laughs> object to the word cohesive self i would say in my language i would say there's a continuity there's some kind of a continuity, which I suspect is that person's cohesive self. And there's also all of this diversity. Mm -hmm. um, right. yeah. But to, I just see we don't have all that much time left. And I'm wondering, um, kind of skipping a bit. Oh, could I say one yeah. more thing about yes. that? Yes. Yeah. Um, skip. Um, I think for me, theory is a story, an image, a conception. It's like a snapshot of something. Mm -hmm. And the snapshot can really help me, but the person isn't the snapshot. Yeah. But I was thinking about this idea of that uh, psychoanalysts talk about self states mm -hmm. and how helpful that is to me because it for me, it evokes this um, experience of how in a, in a particular self-state, I am so 
different than if I could change the channel and be in another self state. But but it's like something comes over you and you are that mm -hmm. and you're not this. And mm -hmm. to describe that as the self state uh, feels very helpful to me, but it might feel horrible to somebody else. So then forget mm -hmm. it. It's only good if it's useful. Yes. Yeah, and that's I think what Heidegger would call befindlichkeit, the kind of the that we're always in a mood, in an orientation in our living. Right. <clears throat> um yeah, interesting. I have to ask one more thing before we skip. <laughs> and um the way you describe it, I think uh I think we actually have it very similarly, but we come at it from different ends of the street in some way like that um, but it makes me wonder if literature because i think there's so much richness about human existence in literature yeah that that also offers a lot of metaphors and insights and mm. would you say theory yes i i think that that every, uh, I think that every uh, writing or now people in therapy are talking more and more about uh, videos and um, and movies and films. Yeah, that that they have the theory of the personal theory of the of the author of the director yes definitely and and it's very helpful because we have theoretical things in common then you know mm -hmm. if we're talking about the same mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. exactly yeah yeah that's a good point yeah so the thing i wanted to skip to very quickly is just curiosity about where all of this has brought you to today and what you're um leading edges or your deepest passion or exciting new project uh well i'm going to try to talk about that at the fot conference and i have to see how i'm going to put that but i think that that with Jean, I learned so much about the individual and about the um, making a place for myself and uh, finding myself and what that self-finding is. And then uh, in psychoanalysis, the, the, the dyad, the partnership, the other, uh, intimacy, all of the issues of taking risks with someone and um, navigating all of that of vulnerability. Uh, and and then um, I've worked with that so much, putting what I know uh, from, from Jean into this, uh, working in the relationship with the relationship and then uh, I think in the last number of years, um, I've gotten very involved with the more than the diet, more than two people, the group, the mm -hmm. society, the culture, the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. and all of those same theories, principles, ideas, how do, how do we use them in navigating our our worlds and uh after trump got elected in in the u.s and i started this project of community empowerment using focusing for um the community uh communication talking uh across difference because the polarization has gotten worse and worse and worse yeah worse and and uh, this morning in the helpers group i i hosted a, a meeting about conflict and what we can 
know of how what can help us in times of the, the conflict inside, the conflict in our families, the uh, or small groups, the conflict in our our world, and how can how can we how can we stand there? But I was thinking recently that the zeitgeist, that I was really following the zeitgeist in a way because the 60s and 70s were very much about finding the individual. And then it felt like the 70s and 80s, at least in our American culture, were about, you know, the the couple, the, the dyad, the partnership, the therapy relationship. And now it, it seems like more and more people are feeling that we, we can't just be in our dyads or uh, that we have to understand how the culture impacts uh, relationally and how we can impact the culture. And the, the takeaway thing, so that if you want to go to something else at the FOT conference and you don't want to come to my workshop i'll give you the 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 takeaway thing <laughs> great <laughs> excuse me <laughs> is that we hope to change the other person the other country the other uh -huh. uh, party and we hope if we can't do that we hope that we'll be found right and everybody will support us Mm -hmm. Or if we can't get that, we hope that we'll be more uh, powerful and mm -hmm. we can intimidate the other in whatever way we, we do that. And and when we can give up all those hopes, mm -hmm. then the hope is that we can't change the other person or the other people or the other idea, but we can change the dynamic. We can change the dance. Yes. And we can do that even inside our ourselves. Um, so so that's the takeaway of, of that. That's I mean, that sounds wonderful to me. And again, very interestingly, what I'm presenting at the FOT conference is called Focusing Oriented Democracy, which is about almost exactly the same thing. But again, I think approaching it from a, a side street or something, not quite exactly the same approach as you're taking. But <clears throat> the takeaway from my talk, I think, is very similar. It's that we need to actually embrace listening as the most fundamental democratic act. Yes. And if we can get to the point where we can tune in to the other's hope of being understood, mm. then we can actually have a real listening exchange where we're not listening to change the person. It doesn't matter if we disagree with the content because we're tuning into the person that's mm. generating it, not what's being generated, but the person in there and their hope of being understood absolutely or even uh, tuning into the the people so if i'm tuning into um the 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 party uh that i'm voting against tuning mm -hmm. in that way of thinking and feeling the situation um that there is an implicit richness there mm -hmm. that I can maybe get a grasp of. I would love to do that. I mean, for the the prime example for us was Brexit, but the same thing as your Donald Trump event. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think, you know, because we hear quite a bit about America, and I think how interesting it would be to find some people from the right. Mm, in, right. For me, that would be the other side. And um, people that are willing to talk about their opinions rather than, you know, people that are actually are, are happy enough to engage and want to be listened to. 
I would love to do that because I suspect that I would be changed. Mm, yes, 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 yeah. yes. Maybe you and I could do that. We'll be on the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are people, of course, doing that. Uh, the the uh, braver angels and, and yes different organizations um but I, I would love to do a dialogue with you about the similarities uh of um your social focusing and 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 my um focusing uh for uh focusing oriented relational community empowerment or whatever whatever it is um but the, but the the concepts that you have there your theory yeah. of um the inner democracy and the and the outer democracy is is very important in in my work i uh and people really take to that really understand that uh, and so I'm very grateful to you coming from across the street. And <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we can have a street party. Yes. Well, let's maybe use that as the beginning of our next conversation. Good. Sounds very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. This was really fun. As always, it's a delight. <laughs> <laughs>